Along the shore lies an expansive stretch of the world's largest coastal temperate rainforest. It holds the greatest diversity of animals in Canada and some of the wildest landscapes. here is pure and untouched. Human hands have played a role in its history more than we might realize. The source of the West's riches is found in the sea. Pacific salmon have been coming here for six million years, before the beginning of the last ice age, and long before the arrival of humans. Every summer, millions of salmon make one of the planet's greatest migrations, swimming from the Pacific Ocean far inland to spawn, often in the same rivers where they were hatched. Their journey defines the West. The salmon sustain many animals, people, and even the land itself. The west coast rises abruptly from the deep ocean, and its nutrient-rich waters attract all kinds of species. Marine mammals like killer whales come here and intercept the migrating salmon. Life proliferates here. These flat-bottomed silty coves may seem unremarkable, but they are not entirely natural. Ancient people created them thousands of years ago to encourage a particular animal to flourish. The clues lie buried. But crows, highly intelligent birds, know their secrets. And at low tide, they dig them out. Clams need the silty substrate to live in, but they still can't escape the crows. Digging them out is only half the job. The birds then have to get rid of the shell, and they know just how to do it. At low tide, clams are easy to spot because they squirt water through their siphons. That is how they breathe, eat, and eliminate waste. Scientists are just realizing why the clams are here in such numbers. Aerial surveys carried out at the low tides showed repeated patterns of rock wall terraces. But because these rocks are usually underwater, they had not been detected before. Only when the First Nations people living on the coast were asked, did the answer become clear. Their ancestors had been farming the seas. They built walls known as mariculture structures, which created an artificial cove. Once silt accumulated behind it, the clams had a perfect place to live and breed. At low tide, they reaped the rewards. collecting clams, and also the whelks and seaweed growing on the rocks. The first peoples along this coast had perfected these sophisticated ways of cultivating food in their environment.
Although the settlements where they lived for over a thousand years are gone, the walls they built still serve their purpose. And it's not only humans that benefit from them. Raccoons have particularly dexterous paws, equipped with thin hairs that enable them to sense prey before they actually touch it. Mink, on the other hand, rely more on their sense of smell to detect food. Some of the walls built thousands of years ago are still intact today. It's easy to forget that the physical landscape of this coast is not all natural. Its looks are significantly different than they would have been without humans. There are almost 250 recorded clam beds in this small area of coastline. Salmon swimming up the rivers are easy targets. When they reach the estuaries, where salt and fresh water combine, they wait for the perfect weather conditions to head inland. As salmon leave the salt water, their bodies undergo major changes to get ready for reproduction. From now until spawn, they stop eating in order to adapt to life in fresh water. They've got limited time to reach their spawning ground, and some of them have a long way to go. And there are many dangers ahead. Rainforest wolves prowl along western coastal inlets. These are prime hunting grounds. Wolves are mostly nocturnal, so it's rare to see them out in broad daylight. This pack is attracted by the prospect of a salmon feast. At low tide, there's less water, which makes the hunt a little easier. Some packs can catch more than 200 salmon in one session. So the hard work pays off. The wolves don't eat the salmon flesh, since it can contain deadly parasites. But they do seem to like the heads. The brains are full of nutrients and free of parasites. The most nutritious part of the salmon is the skin, rich in fat, but it's hard to get at without eating the flesh. So the wolves let other animals do the work for them. They leave their catch in plain sight of the scavengers. The ravens and eagles swoop in for easy pickings. They eat the fresh flesh, but leave the skin and bones behind. When the remains are sufficiently decomposed, the wolves come back and eat the healthy leftovers. Salmon nourish more than 200 species of wildlife throughout the West Coast, playing an integral role in the life cycle here.
The salmon along Canada's western coast make their journey upstream to spawn once a year. Navigation through the rivers is extremely difficult, but they are equipped with special tools to help them find their way. Salmon have an acute sense of smell. They are able to detect one particle in a billion that may be characteristic of the river where they hatched. As they swim upstream, the current gets stronger. In some places, the river becomes so fast and steep, they can no longer swim against it. They have to leave the water to get through. For a moment, they become flying fish, complete with flapping rudders. Their technique is to swim to the bottom and then, thrashing their tails, drive upward as fast as possible. With special cameras, the action is slowed down 80 times its regular speed. Their jumps are the equivalent of a human leaping over a four-story building. The precision of their jumps and the exact point of re-entry can make the difference between life and death. But if they are to reach their spawning grounds, they have to get through. The salmon must keep moving forward, even though new threats await them at every turn. There are predators along their journey, too. As many as 160,000 black bears live in British Columbia. Huge numbers of them head for the rivers to intercept the salmon. Like humans, bears have a varied diet. During most of the year, they are mostly vegetarian. This is the only time they can get such a high-protein diet. Salmon at this stage are still full of energy. And not easy to catch. the bear's persistence pays off. When they catch a particularly big salmon, bears often take it into the forest to eat undercover. In this area, 
Bears and other scavengers carry thousands of tons of salmon into the forest each year. When there is this much salmon available, bears usually only eat about a quarter of the fish, selecting the best fatty parts. The rest of the body and bones rots away and nourishes the trees, and they grow into some of the tallest in the world. Spruce trees in this region can be three times larger than those growing close to other streams, where there is no salmon. Salmon carcasses make the best fertilizer, providing up to 80% of the marine-based nitrogen in these forests and tripling forest growth. For salmon to flourish in the wilderness of Western Canada, they must be able to return to their original spawning grounds. The majority of these red sockeye salmon that left these gravel beds as juveniles anywhere from one to four years ago have not survived. Now the remaining survivors are back to complete their life cycle and reproduce. The females dig out reds, shallow scoops in the gravel to lay their eggs. Then the males swim alongside and fertilize them. Some of the salmon used to get a helping hand from the locals. The Helsic people, who knew the salmon's spawning behavior very well and worked to protect the vulnerable eggs. As soon as the eggs were laid and fertilized, these people gathered and carefully placed them in cedar bentwood boxes, lined with moss to keep them moist. They were then taken away and put in a safe, free-running river. The temperate rainforest of the West provided everything that the First Nations needed. Cedar trees were used for everything from houses and canoes to boxes and clothing. The forest also supplied ingredients for medicines and a safe habitat for land-based animals. But when the Europeans arrived, they saw the land very differently. Captain George Vancouver, who adored the lush meadows of Vancouver Island, found the tropical rainforest less welcoming. He wrote, Our residence here was truly forlorn. An awful silence pervaded the gloomy forests, whilst animated nature seemed to have deserted the neighboring country. Vancouver's men just didn't know where to look. The temperate rainforest is teeming with life, like the unique white spirit bear, found only in British Columbia. Much of life in the forest is found in the canopy. All Vancouver had to do was look up. In the trees above, they would have seen an awesome variety of species and nests, weighing up to two tons. Home to the bald eagles. The chicks attract their mother's attention by screeching the loudest for food. They add essential weight each week by taking food from mom's beak. If food is scarce, not all of the chicks will survive. From the treetops, adult eagles have a great vantage point to hunt for their young. An eagle's eyesight and powerful talons make them formidable hunters.
the forested area of the Helsic territory was maintained by the First Nations people. They saw themselves as custodians of the land. And they transformed their environment when they released their hidden fertilized salmon eggs. This helped populate new streams. And the effects were long lasting, as salmon always returned to the place where they hatched to lay their eggs. So new groups of salmon were created that went on to feed communities, both humans and wildlife, for generations to come. Today's Canadian rainforest still flourishes largely due to the nutrients provided by the returning generations of harvested salmon. Life in the mountains of Canada's western region is tougher than the coastal forests, since it's harder to get around. There is less plant life, less water, and fewer animals. The ones that do live here have had to develop special strategies to survive. Doll sheep are able to live in the mountain peaks where they feel safe. but they have to come down to lower altitudes to eat. And here, predators await. The secretive and solitary lynx is rarely seen in the day. But grizzly bears are bolder. The adult sheep are too nimble to be caught here. But their young are much more vulnerable. In the spring, the newborn lambs have a lot to learn about their mountain homes. They have to quickly figure out how to move up and down the steep slopes. They must keep close to mom. Because their greatest threat is hardest to spot. Golden eagles can see a newborn lamb from a mile away. They can pick up prey equal to their own body weight and fly off with it in their talons. The lambs will be safe as long as they are protected by their mothers and other members of the herd. Luckily, the lambs grow fast. Within a few weeks, they will be too heavy for the eagles to lift. But the eagles make sure to take advantage of the narrow window of opportunity.
wildlife must adapt to ever-changing conditions in the mountains of Western Canada. Bighorn sheep escape to highly remote, windswept areas. Here they can easily scrape away snow and ice and expose buried grasses to eat. These sheep often split into gender groups. Females with shorter horns match with males with larger curved horns. Their horns weigh up to 30 pounds. The growth rings tell how old each animal is, like the rings in the trunk of a tree. The ones with the largest horns achieve the highest status. Having fed all summer, the rams are in peak condition for mating. They inhale pheromones in a female's urine through a special organ on the roof of their mouth to determine her breeding readiness. But first they have to sort out mating rights. They start with playground-like taunts. With kicks and shoves, the weaker rams are tested and their social rank determined. Finally, one male lays the gauntlet down to all the others. Any male who thinks they're strong enough needs to fight to prove it. They charge at speeds up to 18 miles per hour. Fortunately, their skulls are double layered to protect their brains. These duels can go on for 24 hours. The winner now has the pick of the herd. Lambs will be born in spring, time to coincide with the arrival of the lush new growth of grass. But until then, times will be hard. By late autumn, the salmon's mating period has ended, and the banks of rivers are littered with corpses. Eagles gather to finish off the last of the remains. Eaglets born in spring now must fend for themselves in the grand pecking order. Temperatures are falling in Northwest Canada, which means conditions are about to get tougher. The bounty that seemed endless in the summer is now slowly diminishing. But there's one last unlikely wildlife spectacle that plays out before the full force of winter arrives. And it occurs in a most unlikely place This is the northern Yukon Territory in November, near the Arctic Circle. But there is a spot where the complete white landscape is broken up. This is right on the Arctic Circle at 66 degrees latitude. There are no trees this size for hundreds of miles around. 
But there is one solitary river, still flowing, which makes this setting so unique. It has a limestone underground thermal spring. The whole environment is transformed, and locals consider the place sacred. They think it's blessed, since the open water supports salmon this far north. Just like other areas, the salmon carcasses fertilize the spruce trees, giving this Arctic area the appearance of a more southerly forest. Chum salmon spawn later here than anywhere else in the region. From every thousand eggs laid, only one adult salmon will survive and return here to spawn. They are now at death's door, and easy pickings for predators. Grizzly bears have a limited time to gain precious weight before hibernation. Even though it looks like an easy feast, this is actually a fight for survival. They need to devour huge amounts of salmon to ensure that they'll get through the long, cold northern winter. They can eat up to 90 pounds of food and gain up to 3 pounds in body weight in a single day. Any salmon will do, alive or dead. In a matter of weeks on this rich, fatty diet, the bear's shape transforms. Grizzlies stay out late here, braving the minus 20 degree temperatures. Ice forms on their thick, insulated coats. The locals called them armor bears, as they thought arrows could not pierce the thick shards of ice. So they rarely hunt them. Grizzlies are usually solitary, but here, 40 bears gather quite closely together to share the feast. There is a strict hierarchy, based not only on size, but temperament. This is a unique event. It may be the first time grizzly bears have been captured on video thriving on the Arctic Circle. But there is an additional cause for this extraordinary sight. The First Nations group here have always revered this place and protected it. They agreed that no one should be allowed to exploit or destroy it. Today, it is a territorial park, and the grizzlies are left in peace. 
From the frigid Arctic to the temperate rainforest, Western Canada is filled with astonishing wildlife. It is this coexistence and interdependence of nature, animals, and even people that makes this place the true Wild West.